The entire contents of this podcast and website are based upon the opinions of Tammy Garcia and her guests, unless otherwise noted. The information on this podcast is not intended to replace a one-on-one relationship with a qualified healthcare professional and is not intended as medical advice. It is intended as a sharing of knowledge and information from the research and experience of Tammy Garcia and her guests. This is the Naturally Inspired Podcast, coming to you from our 1890 homestead in Johnstown, Colorado. I'm Tammy, and I want to thank you for joining us. Let's get started and help people feel good so they can do what they love for longer. Today on the Naturally Inspired Podcast, we have Ben Joseph Stewart joining us. Ben is a filmmaker, an artist, a lifestyle consultant, and he is the founder of Talismanic Idols Productions. Ben is the creator of Esoteric Agenda, Chimactica, Ungrip, Psychedelica, Limitless, and Waking Infinity News, a ton of just really great content that Ben puts out there. So I hope you enjoy this episode of Naturally Inspired Podcast with Ben Joseph Stewart. Thank you, Ben, so much for being on the Naturally Inspired Podcast today. I am so excited to talk to you because um, Esoteric Agenda was a pivotal point in my life. When I, when I finally watched it, I had experienced, um, you know, just some distrust with the allopathic, um, medical model. And, um, so it's interesting how it takes like one thing for you to kind of start questioning things. And then it just kind of snowballs. Um, so it's really an honor to talk to you today. Cause I can remember back to when I watched that and just the impact it had on me and it it provided so many answers and feelings of, um, I guess of just like connecting to your material because I felt like, okay, I wasn't crazy thinking some of this stuff, right? I'm not alone here. So that was really wonderful. So thank you so much for esoteric agenda. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, it's an honor to be here on your program and, um, and I, I definitely know what you mean that uh, that questioning snowball. It's it's great and it's scary. It's uh, yep. I liken it to um, psychedelics. Sometimes, like you can't say they're good or bad. They're just powerful. Right. And if you use them, you use them in a very intelligent way. They can do very beautiful things. And if you use them in an unintelligent way, it could do the opposite. So right. I feel like uh, our questions are quite the same as well. Mm-hmm. And we're living in such a world right now. And a lot of people are like, how can't everybody else in the world see what I'm seeing? And I think, you know what? I think it's because when you're talking to people who are asleep, you're yeah. not talking about truth or fiction. You're talking about comfort. Uh, and we need to hold space for people who don't know how to step outside their comfort zone. They're, they're more comfortable in the herd. So that was why I started making my films to begin with, was um, helping people see that there are more of us out there that we, we always knew something was up. Yeah. <laughs> we always knew something was up. Yes, and exactly. some of us have just questioned it until we started realizing, ooh, there's a bigger picture yeah. at play. Yeah, that's so true. Um, so tell us a little bit about your journey and who you are. Um, where where were you born and where'd you grow up? What was your upbringing like? Well, I was an army brat. Um, so I was born in Tacoma, Washington. I moved nice. just about every six months. So I lived Whoa. in, you know, Fort Rucker, Alabama, Savannah, Georgia. I lived in Florida for a little bit. Then I moved out into the Marshall Islands, um, Kwajalein, which is um out between hawaii and let's say micronesia oh, okay. um and then i that was a couple of years and then i lived in hawaii a couple of years and then i lived in uh enfield connecticut harrisburg pennsylvania wow boulder colorado you know wow. all around and so um yeah <clears throat> i think the marshall islands was really good because there there was um the marshallese there was a shamanic culture they had oh. tattoos. It's part of the inspiration for the storyboard of tattoos that I have going on here. So all the shamanic influences that I've had. 
it's still growing. And, um, and that was really neat. I was like four or five years old there and I got really sick with tuberculosis apparently. And then I got put on like kind of, was it, I forget the name of the drug actually, but it's, it's kind of like radiation pills in a way. So that was even wow. more dangerous wow. than tuberculosis yeah. at the time for underdeveloped liver and kidneys. Yeah. So I went through a lot of that kind of stuff when I was younger, I lived in Hawaii, experienced a lot of racism towards me and my brother being white. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were Howleys and, um, and it took me a while to understand where that was rooted in. So I began uh, a, a whole journey where my, the two things I was fascinated the most by were, uh, blue whales and native Americans for some reason. And I knew oh, there was this connection with native Americans with the earth. They understood nature in a way that like, you know, we seem to have forgotten. So I've always been yeah. into that. Yeah. And, um, and then I, you know, as I was getting into high school, I was super into sports. I broke my ankle and I was just like, well, you know, I guess I'm going to start playing the drums or, you know, <laughs> guitar. So I got yeah. into music and that really started, um, I started appreciating that more, the direction that that brought me. I started singing and my parents were telling me like, don't quit your day job, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Very and, supportive, um, huh? <laughs> well, well, you know, what was funny about it is they were really supportive, but they, they would, they also gave me, I guess you'd call it a thick skin. Yes. Like I learned how to be in the rock band that I eventually was in because everyone, you take jabs at each other. It was kind of like the rock and roll way. Yeah. And I guess that kind of bled into my films too, because there's people that say like, you know, you, your films, they kind of have a rock and roll edge to them. Yep. They have that kind of, and the soundtrack is very like cerebral, psychedelic. Um, and that's really what, what eventually, you know, I was in a band I was the singer. I never had a problem getting up in front of people singing. Always had an issue for some reason getting up and like having a school paper that I had to read. But once my soul was into it, I never had a problem going out and doing public speaking. Um, But then I had this freak out moment at the age of 17 where I realized like, what am I going to do with my life? I mean, if I'm an artist, if I'm a musician, I have to keep making stuff that people like. Then I'm dependent upon them to keep liking what I do. I had it completely backwards (laughs) in my head. And I was like, you know, what if I go broke? What if I live in a cardboard box? And I just went down that rabbit hole and I was like, (laughs) dad, I want to, I want to enlist in the military. And he was just like, okay, we'll talk about it at dinner. And I was like, no, I want to enlist today. And he was like, and he, and we had a talk and he was just like, okay, you seem pretty serious about it. So he took me to enlist that day. And, um, but he encouraged me, don't go to the army. He was in the army. He encouraged me go to the air force, the same pay, but they treat you better. Um, so I was like, okay, so I did it. And then I instantly hated it. I instantly wanted out, but he told me, he was like, Ben, you took an oath and I'm going to tell you this right now. We Stuart men, we don't break our word. So you're going to do this. You're going to go through it. You're going to do what you said you were going to do. I know you may hate it, but you're going to learn what that feels like. You made a promise. And um, so I did. I I spent um, six years in the military. Six? Age 17 to 23. But in that time, uh, I got into a new band. It was called Hyrosonic. Uh, We played on Lollapalooza next to Jane's Addiction, Incubus, A Perfect Circle. Oh, my gosh. That's Uh, awesome. Yeah. Um, it was amazing. It was amazing. And so we just went off. I was really just a musician from there. But once I got out of the military, that was when I started realizing I could talk about what the military taught me about what was I doing in the military. There were certain things I realized they weren't telling me the truth. I was Mm -hmm. like in theater in certain places and they weren't telling me the truth. And then I was like, well, uh, it was a need to know basis, probably, you know, they couldn't trust a, you know, 19 year old that just discovered alcohol this right. top secret top stuff, secrets, you know? Right. So, so then I just started realizing, like, I want to know more about my place in this world and what I, what I'm here to do. So I began singing about these thoughts and then people were like, well, what's, what is your message about? We know you, you're getting kind of political, kind of religious, kind of philosophical. Like, can you tell us what your message is? And instead of just writing back in text, I decided, you know, I'll make you a film. And so I started working on a film that was supposed to be about the band. And it was supposed to be about 15 minutes long too. And it turned into a two hour documentary <laughs> that had nothing to do with the band. And it was Esoteric Agenda. Wow. Um, it took on a life of its own. 
Um, I wasn't researching for 10 years beforehand. I started researching once I realized I needed to make a film. And that's what blows a lot of people's minds. And I, yeah. I, it was just kind of guided research. One thing led to another. Never right. heard of maritime admiralty law, but bam, I, I found heard, it yeah. out. Yep. It, it became perfect talking about that. Agenda 21 was yep. another thing. It was brand new. Yes. Now people are just discovering that today. I know. I know. And they're even starting to call it um, Agenda 2030. Yep. Um, it went to Agenda 2020, then Agenda 2030. And its nickname is Sustainable Development. Oh, okay. Which I sounds hadn't heard great. that one. Yeah, oh, sounds that great. sounds wonderful. <laughs> but this is where we own nothing and we'll be happy. We'll own absolutely no, nothing, no property, but we will be happy. I think that's a quote from Klaus. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's, um, without getting grim, I think it was either Aldous Huxley or it was George, I think it was Aldous Huxley who said, there will come a time where, the, there will be a pharmaceutical revolution where people will be so drugged and filled with TV and entertainment that they will come to quite enjoy their servitude. Wow. And, and I, that always stuck with me. And Michael Tassari, and he's another great researcher, yep. he's even said that where, you know, if you, if you try and oppress people, they'll revolt. Yeah. If they know they're being oppressed, right. but if they don't realize they're being oppressed or if they only realize it in a subtle way, but the, the illusion and the servitude feels safer, yes, security. Um, then, then people will ask for it. And so if you yeah. think about it, as soon as somebody realized that, which I guarantee you was pre-Roman times, it was probably back in Atlantis. If, you know, if that was actually uh, a place, not just a myth. Um, it was probably known that you frighten people into their brainstem, you know, keep them close to the amygdala, close to the brainstem, mm -hmm. then they're not thinking ex in an expanded way. Um, right. They're really thinking, am I safe or not? They're in right. uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They, right. they can't reach out and like explore and be creative because they're, am I even safe? Do I even know right. if I'm safe? So right. watch the news. Mm -hmm. And what does the news always give you? Fear. It, it's, <laughs> it, yeah, it's amygdala tantalizing. It's just like, look what's happening now. If it's yeah. not 9-11, it's anthrax. If it's not anthrax, it's the war on terror. If it's not the war on terror, it's cybersecurity. If it's not that, there's a pandemic. You know, if yeah. it's not that, it's your neighbors. It's a civil yeah. war that's brewing, right? It's yeah. always like the world's always about to end. Yeah. And um, and then the people who are least informed, most asleep, they just, it's almost watching their parents argue. All they want is the, the intensity to stop. So they just scream, stop, stop. And the parents seem to know, like, I know this seems very violent, but we actually need to communicate. and We need each other to see how the other is making us feel. And, mm -hmm. and yes, yelling never seems like a good thing to do, especially in front of children, because it's, it's too awakening, it's too jarring. quick. Yeah. Right. But, um, but the uninformed masses, and I don't say that in a derogatory way, the uninformed masses, they just want it to stop. They just yeah. want normalcy. They want to feel secure, but they don't realize that that is part of inner work. And you have to, in a sense, um, transcend beyond your innocence and realize nobody's going to save you. You are the adult and yep. we are the ones, we are the generation that needs to make this happen. Yep. And I think we were kind of put into this big system made to feel so insignificant you know like who are you oh i'm one person how many people are there oh well at least seven billion right so now you know your place right, right. And how much money do you make right there's people that right. make a hundred thousand times more to you than you yeah you or know. High, way more educated than you that's another tactic to make to diminish right. your you know oh, you can't possibly have an opinion you only have like a ged how would you know right it's 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 all this authority by sanction and the yeah. sanction is by mob rule and that part is hidden it's like almost like you see the wizard of oz from from a distance and you're like oh my god over the horizon there's this huge being and yeah. you get closer and it's even scarier so your instinct is to run in the opposite direction but if you go closer you realize 
it's just a mirage. And who sits behind that? Yes. This weak, feeble little man. Yep. And that's a perfect, that's a perfect analogy for yep. what we deal with. And it's not just saying that the one percent are weak, feeble, like because that would be insulting. That's not what it is, even though it may be that. But what I'm really talking about is our fears. They they tend to grow and get more and more ominous the closer we're getting to the truth. And yeah. then once we finally take that last stand and like, screw this, I want to know what this is. And you put right. your hand into it and you realize, whoa, it, it doesn't even exist. Yeah. And you peek behind it and there's not even a, a feeble little man. It's nothing. nothing. It's nothing. It was you yeah. the entire time. It was like yeah. Luke Skywalker <laughs> that went into the cave, cut off the head of Darth Vader, cracked open the mask and realized it was him that yeah. he slayed or Neo in the matrix that didn't destroy the agent, you know, Anderson. No, he was Mr. Anderson, whatever the agent, he didn't destroy him. He entered him and became him. Right. right? There right. was like this merging of this, these yeah. polar opposites that became the solution. Yeah. And I really think that's where, um, to get back on point, that's where a lot of us fail to realize that, we are not insignificant. We've gotten hypnotized by this numbers game. I'm one in 7 billion. I'm so right. insignificant. This is what we need to, this is the narrative we need to change. Yes, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, fear exists. It only exists in our mind. It don't, we only project it out. And it's because we live so much in the past of past fears or uncomfortable mm. stuff that we've lived through, or we're projecting on what might happen in the future. And we're constantly living in those two states and rarely recognizing present moment, right? Um, you talked about, you know, kind of connecting. And there's, I feel like when we're inputting all this stuff, this, this negative uh, story that we're taking in, that that is actually what blocks our ability to connect through the heart to the truth. And we get to a point where um, like I was at months ago <laughs> where it's like, okay, I'm like, I've, instead of snapping and being like you said, just end this already, just end this, like give me security or whatever. Yeah. It was a more of a snapping of, I just don't give a shit. <laughs> like I really don't care. Like yeah. you could tell me there's going to be a bomb <laughs> tomorrow and I'm fine. I'm fine. Fair. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are are there as well. Um, that is very interesting. You know, I kind of feel like we, we're always taking in, you know, there's yeah. this thing called the trivium and it's part of the seven liberal, liberal arts. And the trivium is, um, they call it grammar, logic, and rhetoric. <clears throat> and in computer terms, it's input processing and output. Right. And so what, you know, we're always inputting information and so I went through a long period uh, after Esoteric Agenda and Chimatica, my first two films, I went through this long period where I stopped watching anything on the news and I only researched what I wanted to research and I started right. feeling so much happier. Yeah. And I was like, this is good for my heart. Right. And I assumed that that would last forever, that that was, that's my credo and that's going to carry me. You know, that's always going to be my boat carrying right. me. Right. Um, and eventually it turned, the world started changing and I started getting interested in what was going on in politics again. And I started watching the news, but my, my distance from it for a while got me looking like, you know, a man on his Island or on the mountain, just staring down at what was going on. And finally I entered it again with a new perspective, realizing I get it. All these people that I thought were adults aren't, yeah. <laughs> that's like the number one. If you watch anything in politics yeah. they're not adults i'm mm -hmm. sorry tulsi gabbard was like one of the and and there's more than just tulsi gabbard but just in the like the people who are running for president mm -hmm. Tulsi gabbard and ron paul are like two of the only individuals that i was like i believe every word coming out of your mouth yeah and you actually seem like an adult yeah and 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 i could say the same for bernie i just don't like him as much but he he meant every word and he's an adult you know he wasn't yeah. this like well let's just you know kind of you know hit my twitter page <laughs> or like like yeah. aoc it doesn't matter what side of the partisan line you're on it yeah. feels like it, it's almost like the movie idiocracy if you got the followers 
bam, you got the bucks. Well, where and, are we when one of the first things reported after um, January 6th when Mike Pence did not um, do what you know people thought he was going to do and, and not uh, certify the vote? Mm -hmm. um, one of the first headlines I read was Vice President Pence unfriends uh, President Trump on Twitter. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is embarrassing at this point. Wow. Like, this is really embarrassing. Now we're yeah. judging things by how many followers we have. And like that, like, I just sometimes I, I agree with you. It's like being in high school or yeah. even middle school. With some Unfortunately, of this yeah, unfortunately, it, it still is, and you probably see this as well. It's more intelligent than that. It takes on the persona of this, what are we in high school? Yeah. But the intelligence that's driving it is not that. It knows no. that you use younger, less informed, less wise voter bases. You you bring them, and, and AI does this, let's be honest. All yeah. your social media, yeah. they have algorithms that knows how long you stay on a certain image before you keep scrolling or how, you know, what you think on a post. And it documents literally not just the, the content, but the context of what you're saying, right. how disgusted you seem to be, how angry or furious you seem to be. Mm -hmm. And so with that, it really seems that these algorithms, what they're doing is they're pandering to, okay, if you're an introvert, let's send you kind of conspiracy style stuff. So you fear the machine and you step back from it. We don't want you voting if you distrust. If you do trust, that means you either trust the left hand or the right hand, and we want you voting. It doesn't matter what if you if you vote left, if you vote right, we still got you. Right. Right. You're in the you game. know, th th this guy or it still still has you. And so the algorithms have figured this out. If you're an extrovert, drive them to vote. Make it popular. Make it seem sexy. Make it seem cool. Make it hip again, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. whatever you got to do to push that. Is it populism? No, back to the swamp. Well, populism, you know, do we need a third party? And a lot of the times, like, it's really what it is, is we're waiting for the, for the machine to give us the, the, the solution that the seems that the machine seems to be creating. Right. So we're, we're waiting for the machine that created the problem to give us the solution, the solution. to it. Yeah. And most of us can't see the conflict and in interest. We don't even know what conflict and in interest really means. We're just like, but solution sounds good. I feel scared about this. And right. you're saying this and yes, go ahead and give me that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, so I guess going back to your original um, statement about like taking in information, it can block you from the heart for sure. And I think that many wisdom traditions, they say, take in a little bit of information and meditate a lot. Read a little bit, meditate a lot. Right. And I think most people do the exact opposite in far different proportions. Yes. They read, 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 watch, 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 mm -hmm. listen to narrative, listen to narrative, social media, social media, social media, 0 0.0001 meditate. Yep. And I think this is why most of us don't even understand that the heart has intelligence. Like that's actually now a thing that Just we have to have out. places yeah. like Heart Math Institute yes. to be like, guys, not only is it intelligent, it has, it's the strongest electromagnetic field generator up to six feet outside the body. It mm -hmm. mingles with people up to six feet outside the body. Now yep. take a look at the social distancing measures that were under six feet social distance. Yep. And there's more neurons traveling from the heart to the brain than in the opposite direction. Meaning yep. the heart doesn't need to know what the brain's saying all that much, but the brain needs to know what the heart is saying. Mm -hmm. So there's there's very interesting correlations here that, you know, your gut also has neurons. And yeah. I think the brain is the whole thing outside of the spine. It's all the peripheral organs and glands, you know, outside of the spine. And I bet you the same thing goes for our fat cells or muscle cells, all those things. There's a form of intelligent in, uh, intelligence in there. 
Right. So I kind of feel as a system and that's an allopathic medicine. We don't ever address that either. We never address our body as a whole system. I mm. mean, I think it, they give it lip service now fairly recently, you know, that there's this connection to, to our, our mind and body, but I feel like yeah. it's still just lip service. It doesn't really get to the point of this is an entire system. And like yeah. you mentioned, the connection to the gut, to the, to the brain, to the heart. Um, and I think one thing we've diminished so much is some of these old sayings that I always still say that my Nana used to say, you know, like, oh, they died of a broken heart. Like literally these, you know, couples that have spent their entire life together and then die one or two days apart or five days apart, or, you know, sometimes it takes a few more months, but there's a, there's a noticeable difference when that yeah. disconnect happens in yeah. the quality of life for the person left. But we just throw all those sayings out. Like they're like our ancestors didn't say that for a reason. Right? It's we did a, a cleansing. <clears throat> we definitely did a cleansing. I mean, like the Rockefeller Institute was yeah. very instrumental in, in pushing away um any kind of holistic um absolutely petrochemicals came into fruition and right. it was all over for holistic care. And, you know, the, the thought is like, well, then let's blame the Rockefellers. And I'm, I'm of yeah. the mind that it's like, no. And, you know, like, A, it doesn't, like, it disempowers you when you have to look for the enemy in mm -hmm. specific people. Yep. It's like, if you realized your own power, you would realize that was the wrong way to go from the get go. Yeah. Is the wrong way to start. So the real way to start is acknowledging your own power, acknowledging that it comes not just from community, but from the earth itself. Mm -hmm. And there is no disconnection. And I think right. that the, the whole way that we look at the body is all these individual parts. Like, well, yeah. let's, let's examine the, you need the a physics kidney of doctor. It. You need a heart doctor. You need a brain <laughs> mm -hmm. doctor. You know, there's, a, there's such separation. Yeah. And, and in that, if you think about it, it could also be very brilliant. Like, you know, this way you need an industry that is built. Now yeah. it used to be like, you know, oh, big pharma. No, it's, it's insurance companies because everything's yeah. driven by liability now. Yeah. So if you think about it, like if you just find the thing that everything else has to, according to your government, you know, according oh, to all law, everyone agrees. Well, there has to be some kind of liability. So it's an insurance company. But if you are the CEO of a huge, huge company, uh, company, you can remove your liability and put your liability on the company itself. That's why we needed to make companies persons, right? We needed yes. them to be protected under the constitution as well. And that way you can get the military and paramilitary forces to protect your institution from the people. Right. But wasn't the constitution written, you know, wasn't it for the people of the people by the people? Yeah. And this is a person too. And, and, and they have enough money to hire all the, the paramilitary forces. Right? right. And, and they have the ones, the lawyers to put it, you know, to preempt what's going to happen. We know this, this, uh, um, how should I say it? Uh, a protest is going to happen. We know it. <laughs> we preempted it because yeah. we ran it through our supercomputer you know, people are going to push back. So let's yep. get our lawyers in place. Let's already talk to, you know, hey, if people start uprising, you need to come. It's your duty, right? And yeah. they come and they do their duty, you know. So I guess where I got off on that was we compartmentalize things yes. in such a way that no one person can understand the simple connectivity of it all. And in a way, it's almost become illegal too which is starting to become the, the biggest issue is many people try to represent themselves in, in uh, the court of law and it's becoming harder and harder and harder. Oh, yeah. and the reason why most people who represent themselves, like vast majority, I think more than 99% of people who represent themselves are unsuccessful. Why? Because it is literally written into the uh, you know the law that lawyers understand how to speak the legal language. It literally is a different language, yeah. and that's why you know in um, you know Webster's dictionary, you look up the word person, mm -hmm. you'll have a page or less, probably less than a page for the word person. But you go to Black's Law Dictionary. 
the dictionary that they use. Yeah. And person will run for like 20 pages or more. Wow. And some, some people have even said like there's entire books on all the multiple definitions of person that represent, that come from different precedents. So configuration, this is what a person is. In this configuration, this is what a person <laughs> oh is. God. And for your audience that, that doesn't know, a person now in legal terms does not mean flesh and blood. blood. It does not mean that at all. It yeah. only means the legal fiction created in your name on paper, now, you know, in digital ones and zeros and soon to be on the blockchain. Wow. So we're not allowed. We're actually not allowed to know the language of that which governs us because, right. you know, let's be honest, the, the court of law, most people, they feel governed by it. I'm right. sorry. Hold on. I got someone decline. I had somebody calling oh, in. No I would put it on uh, airplane, but then we wouldn't be able to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really interesting because as you're explaining that, I'm thinking of like how much industry and compartmentalized industry drives us. And I personally am just, you know, finding myself more and more wanting to pull away from all of that. So like take real estate, for example. Okay. You can sell your own house. It's totally legal, right? Of course you can sell your own house. It rarely happens because the industry blocks you from doing that. They don't let you go on the MLS. They don't let, you know, realtors don't even, will, won't even show you houses that are for sale by owner. A lot of the time they just won't. Right. They've all agreed on a certain percentage that they're going to get paid out. Now they say they haven't, right? Legally, they're like, oh, well, we can't do that. But they all charge 6% in this state. <laughs> like, is that coincidence? <laughs> That's not right. coincidence, right? So what they do is they, they, that the industry and the, the interesting caveat to that is that it's all people participating in it. Mm -hmm. So you're doing this, you're pushing this agenda upon your own people and yourself. But we, 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 we just are complicit with it. Right? Survivalism. Yeah. We've been given a framework. And I think this is actually, you know, like, I'm glad we're going here because I actually think it doesn't matter if we if we look at it as corrupt, because the deepest layer of reality shows us that it's perfect. And and I'll get to that in a second. But okay. like, we're born into a system. Yeah, that um, it's tribal in a sense. So real estate people, they're kind of tribal and oh, they're totally. like, well, like, totally. this is what I get into. And this is, these are my people. This is, these are the ones I understand. Yep. And, and we're going to, how are we going to survive yeah. if we don't charge? So they have logic that if you were to hear them out, you'd be like, Oh, I get it. Yeah. And then, you know, but then if they were to fully hear out you know, the, if there was a singular voice from all the people who that's disadvantaging, mm -hmm. if there was a singular voice that they could hear out, they would probably be like, yeah, you're right too. Right. Well, how about we do this? But then that solution disadvantages somebody else. And you're like, okay. no, 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 we can't do that because then we're, a, and then eventually, which never happens, if everyone were to be fully heard, like there's a round table of every tribe, and there's a, an elder from every tribe and everyone gets heard, you'd probably have everyone being like, so everyone's screwed? <laughs> Is there anyone that's not screwed? Right? Okay, we're good now. We're all screwed. <laughs> then, it's the, then it's the system. Then it's the framework that yeah. we are operating under that needs. So that literally means like, oh, so we've been playing Monopoly when we really should have been playing shoots and Ladders. Okay. All right, so let's start playing shoots and ladders. How dare you? Are you a communist? <laughs> and then you start realizing who who you're attacking, you right. know. But but in a sense, the ones who attack you are are not the ones pushing the fear. They're the ones who have been taught to self police. Right. And that's what we are right. doing in this country right now. Yes. Who's pushing the vaccines the most? The people the mainstream around media us. anchors <laughs> and the people around you being yes. like, you know, how dare you? Don't you know my yeah. grandmother died and blah, blah, blah. Selfish. And it's just like, I'm, I, I'm sorry for your grandma, yeah. but do you understand that forcing a needle into somebody without their consent is tantamount to rape? It's yeah. like, you know, no, it's not rape, blah, blah, blah. It's just like, wait, why, why can't we have a civilized conversation? Yes. Right. And, and so like, and on the other side, 
they I can also see where they come from feeling like, you know, these these silly people who don't want to listen to science, even though we do. Yeah. You know, but from their side, they don't see that because they've been given a very specific narrative. And it's like if they ever say they do listen to science, they're talking pseudoscience. So attack them. Right. You know, no, I am reading the articles. No, you're not. You're reading Fox News or you're reading pseudoscience. And like that stuff, that's Snopes never fact check that. (laughs) Right. So so we get into all these tribal battles. And so the very, very basis of it to me regardless of whether there's uber wealthy elites, even extraterrestrials running the show behind the curtains, regardless Mm -hmm. of all of that, if you look at the fabric of reality, we are all one, all things, including this computer that I'm talking to, in order for you to have my likeness on the other side of this machine speaking to you so you can understand me. Like, Everything, and I've had people say this, you know, it's just like, you know, F5G and F technology and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, all I'm hearing, if you take out the context of what you're talking about, all I hear is you griping and moaning and complaining and using curse words and, and hate and disgust and anger. And if you just look at your behavior, is that what you call grace? Is that what you call spirituality? Is that what you call beauty? Is that what you came here to share with the world? Right. I doubt it. I doubt it. So the underlying fabric of all reality shows that this is actually the perfect framework for us to awaken. First, we have to awaken and do what the Buddha says. First, you need right sight. You need to see things correctly. And that you need to open your mind in order to see things correctly because your mind filters what you see and then you remember what you saw differently because your mind and your beliefs. So you need to suspend judgment, really be open, understand your own biases in order to just see things clearly. And then the Buddha says, once you have right sight, then you need to understand, you need right understanding. So you need to understand what you're seeing because a child looking at something, you know, like a riot, doesn't understand it like an adult does, right? right? So you need right sight, then right understanding. And only once you have both those two, can you have right action. So now you think about it. Why do we have all these young people voting? Because they barely see the world correctly. They could not be uh, held accountable for misunderstanding what they don't even see correctly. Right right? They're looking at a blurry picture and one pixel of that blurry picture. Yeah, You know, they don't have the wisdom to see the perspective. So you can't even blame them. They haven't had enough time on this earth. The framework of the system is, is where the issue is. So we need an awakening to the fact that none of us see it correctly. Right. Therefore, none of us understand it correctly. Therefore, Every one of our actions are based in something that is violating one another and the earth. We are in violation of every relationship. And this is why I wouldn't run. But if I were to run for president or if there were some other system where I would have, you know, a a real voice to get it out to people. Yeah, I would say every, um, you know, and and this is going to sound quite rudimentary to economists and, and people like that. But. Every supply chain for food and resources are still open and they will go and everyone will be supported by a new system. All things are redistributed, but it's not redistributed wealth. What this is, is we're going to keep those supply chains going while we heal. And that healing is going to look like in America, we are going to spend one minute for every Native American that we can document that was murdered or killed. Um, there were millions, millions of indigenous on this land. And we're going to hold ceremony. If that takes years, then we have several years of ceremony. And we're going to honor everybody that was squashed by this form of colonization that we are all psychologically colonized by. And then we're going to do it everywhere around the world. Mind you, all the supply chains of everything people need are still going on, but we're not focusing on, well, where's mine? Is this fair? Is that not fair? You're not in is, is what I'm getting fair. None of us are being fair. Right. Daddy needs daddy and mommy. Now it's mother earth needs to chime in. I'm going to take everything away from all of you. You get to eat and you get to survive and you get to see what you've done as humanity. 
Those are the three things you get. And we're all going to hold ceremony until we heal. And a lot of us are not going to like it. And that's just how it's going to be. And we're just going to heal. And it's going to be like an ayahuasca ceremony. And you are going to have to come to wake up to the harm and the violations that we have not only given our brothers and sisters, but this planet, a species that we're eradicating at an astronomical rates so we can eat hamburgers, so we can clear the rainforest, so we can have more farmland, so we can burn more of the Amazon under the guise of climate change and, and say, look, now we need the Great Reset. Right. All of it's BS. We need, we need our own reset. But we don't need uber wealthy people saying, COVID-19, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you how we're going to redistribute. I'm going to tell you how we're going to hit the reset button. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do about the climate. No, Klaus, I love you, but you are one voice. So am I. We don't get any different of a voice. If I could do a reverse Bitcoin or a hollow coin, like a holistic coin blockchain, where everybody on the blockchain, open source, no privacy, nobody gets any more privacy until, you know, sex trafficking and child trafficking is done. Nobody gets any privacy. Like, I don't care if if you have sensitive documents or if there's national security, nobody gets it. If there are children anymore. Yeah, exactly. No one can be trusted. Not a single person. Everything is broadcast from the satellites to everybody's device. Mm -hmm. The algorithms are used to show you who's screwing you over, who's being kind, (laughs) right? It like the great awakening could happen through AI and everything is on the blockchain. There's no way you can unverify it. There's no way you can hack it. Right. And, And this is, this is how we stay accountable. And mind you, this is a thought process. There's going to yeah. be so many people that are like, I came up with 50 holes for that entire argument. <laughs> I get it. I get yeah. it. This is yeah. a thought experiment. But yeah. this is where I would go with, if I had a stronger voice politically or mm-hmm. whatever it is, I would say, we're done doing everything except healing. Now is global ceremony. We get to eat to survive. We get you know Supplies enough water live. and enough yeah. shelter to survive. We get guidance and support as we go through our uh, rapture, our awakening process, because mm. it's not pretty. And we are going to account and make amends for every horror that we have caused upon this earth. Yeah. And then we'll get to talking about who deserves what, right. but only, only afterwards. Right. And if you've ever seen anybody come out of a, an ayahuasca experience, they're so humbled. All they want is to share love. That's all they want to do is they want to go say, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. And I want to show you how much I love you, how much I care for you. They kiss the earth. They roll around in it. They love it so much because they realize I'm just happy to be alive. I have a glimpse of this thing called life. Right. That's what I would do. Do you think then in this healing that the, the, the answer lies in gratitude, extreme gratitude? And then that's what we're we're lacking. And sometimes, you know, I've been trying to find the reasons for this, you know, because I know that we're right where we should be there. We are. That's a fact. I believe that we're right where we should be, but what am I, what am I getting from this experience? Mm -hmm. Right. I'm always trying to figure out, okay, what, what is, what, what is my, what am I getting out of this? What am I, what am I uh, do to learn? And so in this scenario that you're talking about, do you think that if we held ceremony for the atrocities of the past that we could then let go of all this i need i need reparations i need reparations i i mean everybody can we just agree that okay we've we've we can put healing to bed or we can put our pain to bed with this healing could we get there well thank you thank you so much for asking that um and it's very interesting yeah because um, we all de- deserve reparations, but when we all deserve reparations, you typically think who's the offending party. Yeah. The offending party is humanity and we're sick, yeah. you know? So we need to stop thinking of it in terms like that because even white people were colonized. It just yeah. happened so long ago. Irish we forgot that we had slaves. tribes. Yeah. We forgot that we had tribes. So, you know, that's, um, I think it is easiest. You can always feel gratitude, but try telling somebody who feels offended, well, just feel grateful. Right. Right. It's not that easy. No. So there needs to be this impetus or a catalyst for it. And in a sense, 
it's it's kind of strange but if your body is this? acidic could that be this it could be well th- it, and that's why i say this you know if your body is acidic mm-hmm. why do you why is one of the most alkalizing things you could do is to drop acidic lemon juice into water and drink it because the response in the body is to push back and overcompensate. So you become more alkaline. And, you know, the same thing kind of goes for, if you need to relax your body more, the best thing to do, yoga does this. um, A lot of movement modalities do this. And even some uh, psychotherapists do this, tense your entire body up and then let go. Right. So you do the opposite first and then you let go. That's the point of ceremony. Really, like how do you surrender into love? You need to face your demons. Yeah. How do you surrender into equanimity? You need to go deeply into your ego and see every um, ramification of you feeling like you are you and you have to get yours and you need you know, attention and you need credit and all that kind of stuff. You need to go into that in order to really let go. And so where do we get, how do we get to the point where all of us feel gratitude? First, you need to be humbled. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's done any kind of plant medicine or who has really, really been humbled by their grandma or, you know, by by a friend or something like that who just called you out so perfectly that's mm-hmm. like oh my god you're right yeah. you're so right i'm so yeah. sorry that's being humbled and most of us is that the attitude you see in the protests no <laughs> no is that the attitude you see out of politicians no no is that the attitude you see out of any news anchor no none of them seem humble no. and i'm sorry to say it most people and we're all becoming influencers now we mm-hmm. you know and i struggle with this as a personality as well, is to hold that space of humility while talking about a deep, dark issue. You know, let's point out the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution and how like COVID-19 is being used as an impetus for a surveillance track and trace prison planet run from satellites in outer space. Let's just call it what it is. It's what it is. Nailed it. Okay, I could be wrong, but prove prove me wrong. And, yeah. and so like in that, it's hard for me to, was I humbled when I said, prove me wrong? Right. Not so much. So Am you see where the enemy? difficulty is. Yeah. So, so even, even the, the most intelligent and even very, very wise, beautiful people, we fall into these traps. And yeah. this is why we need to hold ceremony together because we need a community support. We can't just wait. Like, I hope Donald Trump, I hope right. all the Q people are correct. <laughs> right. So Donald Trump can save us. Yeah. Like, that's no. a lot of people holding on to that. Right. And, and again, it's this common theme of wanting to go outside ourselves for save to, to be saved. Right. And I think there's mm-hmm. a lot to be said um, on your point with, yeah, it's hum- being humble, but also self-love and, and real self-love. Right. Because yeah. when you're, when you have real self-love, you don't require your ego to be fed. You don't require this constant something from coming outside when you can recognize yeah. yourself as, you know, a spiritual being and that, you know, your creator is your father and that you are loved by that source yeah. infinitely, then you can bring it inside and be like, well, I don't need, I don't really need that. I'm good. Yeah. I'm okay. And, and also being accepting of your errors right? When you, we say this all the time, like nobody's perfect. Well, nobody's perfect, but we don't really believe that because the minute somebody is not right, we just pile on. And the reason why we pile on is because it makes us feel comfortable with our own, with our own mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody else, but it's always outside. And this is the time I think of inner work, real inner work. And I mean, I, I don't know how to say it more with impact, but seriously, inner work is where we're at right now. That, that really needs to be focused on. Yeah. And, um, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't happen in one sitting Mm -mm. and that's why like it has to happen yesterday. Yeah. And as we get closer and closer to this, this, uh, crisis climax, Mm -hmm. That we're barreling towards um it's just the band-aids coming off 
it's about to come off. We just yeah. keep we keep talking about it, guys. I'm about to reset this bone. Do you realize yeah. this? Yeah. Like all of y'all are playing around, not even pretending you're not preparing yourself. You're not taking a deep breath. Like I'm about to reset this bone. Yeah. And a lot of you are going to be in a lot of pain. Right. And, and I think that's kind of, <clears throat> that's where a lot of the issue lies. I feel like the biggest issue with crisis points in history, which, you know, I've, I've talked about this in my waking infinity. There's this book yeah. called the fourth turning yeah. that says every 80 to 90 years, there's a crisis period. And we yeah. are literally without fail. It's a 15 to 25 year period. And it said, once the inciting incident starts, it will not be any shorter than 15 years, not be any longer than 25 years. And they wrote this back in 97 and they were like somewhere around 2005, it's going to spark. Well, it happened to be 2008 with the housing bubble. Yep. So they're like, okay, somewhere around 2028, it's going to end. Um, but around 2020, it's going to start peaking. Boy, were they right in 1997 right. when they wrote this book. Right. And um, they were saying a lot of the times it ends in war. And if it ends in war, it's very likely to keep rolling with its momentum into total war because yeah. It's it. They weren't even saying like, well, what are the Chinese doing? What are the Ameri no? They were just like, I'm just looking at the cycles of history. It keeps going. Right. You know, it's almost like a fight. You ever seen somebody get knocked to the ground and then yep. they just keep pummeling the person? Yes, it's that's horrible. almost right. But that's yeah. almost like what they're saying happens. Like, you're not just beaten. It's not just like you know, okay, you won. I guess we'll go back home or not. No, it's like a no. We're gonna. We're going to show you the point we came here to show you. We're taking everything. We're taking all your land. We're taking your government. We're taking your morale. Yep. We're taking, you know, your children, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And we're using the most powerful weapons we have at our disposal. And it sounds super scary, but really what we're talking about is the reset is coming. You know, and it's not like the World Economic Forum Great Reset is coming. This is a mythical cycle in, in human history that seems that is upon us. Yes. And I get excited, strangely. It's because, like, <laughs> we need a reset, but we need the awakening that comes after it. And what right. seems to have, have happened in past history is we keep thinking we're moving into a more intelligent, more equitable you know, intelligent governance system. Right. And the whole thing is moving towards global governance, a one world government. Yep. And everyone and hears that term. And eventually a one world like, religion. Right, right. Well, and the one, one world religion. Thinking. Right, exactly. It's, it's, you know, religion is an aspect of consciousness. So is science. It's an aspect of consciousness. And we've been conditioned to believe that religion is out there and you have to go to a church. You have to read a Bible. It's all these external things. Right. And science, it's out there. Where are the scientists, the institutions? Well, we're talking science. No, you're talking what the pursuit of science has done to you and how that turned into a book. Right. That's what you're talking about. You're talking about <laughs> data. Yeah. You're not talking about science. Science is the pursuit of knowledge it's to know the literal word word means to know yeah. and religion is religare it, it means to bind together to hold together to fuse two things like yoga union between yeah. you and god or you and universe so these are aspects of consciousness mm -hmm. and we've again we've externalized it in many ways so back to the point this whole one world government there's no problem with one world government if we were all living in love Right. You can give me communism. If I knew 7 billion people were living from their heart, I would say, let's play Monopoly as our government. Let's, let, I don't care what yeah. ism you give me. Right. If we're all in love, we're going to be a lot better off than the most intelligent ism with no love. Right. I say, give me communism with love than give me capitalism with no love. Because it's right. not about the ism. It's not about the game. It's about right. love. And right. we are constantly... No, there are no simple. atrocities in love, right? So uh, right. communism historically has produced, you know, atrocities, but not if it's if communism had love and it was based on love, then all of the, the actions that created atrocities wouldn't be functionable. Yeah, yeah. We always look for the label and the yes. name. Yes. It's communism. In you everything. know how many people died in the name yeah. of God? People would have probably killed people without the name of God. 
They're killing people in the name of government. They're they're like, we're not living in love Mm -hmm. and we're sick and we don't Mm -hmm. realize it. And this is why I say we need healing. Yeah. We as a species need healing. And really, I don't see another form of government or another economic model or more on the blockchain and more accountability. It's just all these new nuances that were like, well, I guess that sounds better because it's correcting this past mistake. Yeah, but a correction of a mistake doesn't mean, cor- you know, it's going to be better, th- improved. It doesn't mean you're bringing it back to a holistic state. Right. It just means like, if you're center and you're meandering out into infinity, oh no, you're going this direction. Correct. Yeah, that's a correction, but you're still meandering <laughs> towards infinity. You're not coming back to center. Right. So this is where I say like healing needs to be self-discovery. And we need to do that with one another. And we've forgotten how to do that. And there's so much xenophobia, like, well, do you think it's China? Do you think it's Russia? You mean the humans, our brothers and sisters that speak different languages and that (laughs) land across the water? That look almost exactly like us. (laughs) Yeah, that slightly different skin color, slightly different eyes, different language, probably so much beautiful heritage and history I would love to learn about. Yeah. Right? You mean those people? (laughs) Yes, they're my brothers and sisters. I can't wait to learn how to love them better and show them that I mean them no harm, and I I wish them only awakening and and, and true love. Mm -hmm. And this is so wishy-washy. It's so new agey to talk about love and healing. And that's another part of the trap. Make the solution sound nuts. Sound like, oh, you're such a juvenile. You don't know how socioeconomics really works. Like, I don't need to know how your stupid game works. It's done right. nothing but harm and violation on this planet. Right. And Mother Earth is paying the, uh, the price. And now we're saying, well, who do we ask to help correct this climate? Whatever's going on with the climate, I'm not going to name it. Yeah. You know, even I think a lot of it's geoengineering. But mm-hmm. like whatever's going on with the climate, who do we ask to save us? Well, it seems like we're just asking the people who created the problems in the first place. Yeah, it's like exactly. who caused. If you listen to the narrative, who caused the problem? Ah, uh, the people did. No, I think the corporations <laughs> yes. and the major industries did. We're that. not pumping out all the toxins. I don't know everywhere. a single person that I'm uh, associated with that goes down and burns down the Amazon or clear no. cuts fields and. I don't even know anyone you know, that litters anymore. I, I don't anymore. know anyone. <laughs> You know, right, exactly. You, you're like so, appalled if someone litters near you. <laughs> exactly. And so who who's going to pay the real price? Who yeah. really, really benefits for all the Kyoto protocols back in Brazil in 91 mm-hmm. when we're like, we're destroying the planet. What do we do? Mm-hmm. Agenda 21. What does yeah. that mean? We'll make humans not be allowed to touch nature anymore. We'll pack them into smart cities and we'll trace and track every move. That yeah. sounds like a great thing to oh, do. Oh, but the by climate. the way, this completely <laughs> fills our bank accounts because we can control every aspect of their entire lives. <laughs> That's yeah. just side effect. Right, right. And and it, it's funny that, you know, like we've even gotten kind of like facetious and sarcastic, but like, this is what happens for the audience. This is what happens when you've been reading about this, you've been speaking about this, mm-hmm. and there's so many people who it's uncomfortable for them to hear it. Yeah. So they attack you for these yes. ideas. Yes. And unfortunately, the sarcasm comes out where it's yeah, just like, no, exactly. why doesn't anyone see that this is happening? Yeah. And we can say it in love. Yeah. We don't have to be these angry people screaming no. into a megaphone or or you know pointing out you know we need to burn all the pedophiles and like no we don't need to burn human beings the worst punishment you can give to evil people is love the yeah. worst punishment for them is love yeah. and it's also the best healing you can give anything like i don't care what somebody else in some elite family has done why do you use that as an excuse for you to feel hate in your heart? Mm-hmm. That's the biggest like trick that we've been played is like, right. if you don't feel hate for pedophiles, then that means you agree with pedophilia. No, it no. does not. <laughs> yeah. I'm allowed to feel love for anybody, but love doesn't mean I agree. Love right. doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. I'm soft and goopy yeah. because I love and, and go ahead right. and do whatever you're doing. I'm going to turn the other cheek. No. Love will not stand for harm. Love will not stand for violation. What we're dealing with is fear parading around as toxic masculinity and courage. So it's fear parading around as courage 
parading around as patriotism, you know, and that's where we say, you know, that's where all this intellectual hubris comes from, where we self-police each other. And if somebody says, like, I don't know if I agree with the vaccines. Oh, yeah, you probably read this and blah, blah, blah. And we get into this attacking mode to make them feel stupid for having diversity in ideas. So we're all talking about, you know, like, we're, we're so racist. We're such a racist species. But I hate you if you think any differently than me. It's like color. We need to accept each other's color. But if you think any differently than me, it's just like, no, like we're all different. Let's celebrate our differences, right. including the mind, including our beliefs. And let's realize that people who think differently can help our checks and balances. So we're not living in an echo chamber. Because when we live, you know, then we have nothing. I built up my social media with nothing but yes men. That way all my beliefs reach extreme, extreme narratives. And nobody's telling me, dude, I think you need to chill out a little bit (laughs) because you're inciting a civil war maybe. (laughs) And no, nobody says that because they're all in their own echo chamber being like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But social media is designed for that exact, that is its exact model because Mm. the whole intent of social media is to capture your time. So when you are engaged in one article after another that validates your, your bias, you continue to stay on there. And then we also have this thing that's happened in our culture where it's not permittable to oppose anybody's opinion. It's actually now rude. You're just rude. If you, you know, if you, if you question someone like, why do you think that way? Or, you know, it's this immediate pullback and I don't want to talk to you. I'm not going to argue with you. Well, I'm not inciting an argument. I just want to try to understand Mm -hmm. why you're thinking that way. So I can then bounce that off why I'm thinking the way I am and then come to some kind of understanding, a better understanding, but that's not even workable in the model that we have right now we're highly emotional and triggered and if you think about that that means we are traumatized and our our trauma is being poked and it's being poked you can say it like we're being played because in a way we're kind of being played Mm -hmm. but we're also who's playing the player it's it's god the universe which is us Right. So in a sense, we are mirroring back to ourselves. This is how we heal. And so social media, <clears throat> I don't care who built it. It it can be whatever it wants to be. And that's not because, you know, like women can be whatever they want. Kids can right. be whatever they want. And so can the internet. Like, no, a- anything can be anything. This is a very dynamic uh, universe that we live in. I think it's far more holographic than we give it credit for. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because you know, social media, like with TensorFlow, it's an open, open source, um, yeah, AI that allows for people to generate, um, you know, I think it's TensorFlow that, that it has two mechanisms to it. One is a machine that generates fake news. And the other one is a, um, a discriminator to see if it can discriminate between the fake news and the the human generated news or or news that comes from the humans huh. and so it's it's a way for it to get closer and closer to what would a human say how would a mm. human correct its argument and this this is kind of how it's all working and what this guy i think is oh man i wish it would be errol surat errol surat he, okay. he did a great ted talk where he was talking about fake news when they did a huge study on it back in 2012, I think, like way before this was even a popular uh, term Passion. that yeah. was being thrown out there, yeah. he noticed that fake news was retweeted um, far more than real news, sometimes by orders of magnitude. And what was shared the most was any kind of fake news, specifically political news, that caused disgust and hate and anger. Interesting. So if you can tickle those centers of the brain, yeah, you know you can make people act. If you yeah. can get them into disgust, yeah. you know you can make them act. If you get them to hate something, you know you can get them to act. But I think that's because we haven't reached its potential yet. And social media is potential. Like, so I know I can make somebody act if I can get them to hate and and absolutely be disgusted about something. But most of us have not reached that ability to know 
how do I, if I wanted to give you an aha moment, mm -hmm. right? If I wanted to give you this divine, like, like a plant medicine or a meditative, like epiphany moment where everything in life makes perfect sense in the here and now. And it's just like, oh my God, I get everything. I get it all. A lot of us have had these moments mm -hmm. before yeah. and they're fleeting. Yep. If I could give you one of those moments, it would probably be far more effective than hate and disgust. Yeah. But it's far more nuanced, maybe not even nuanced, maybe it's far more simple, you know, but far fewer of us, I should say, know how to deliver an aha epiphany godlike moment than we do know how to deliver disgust and hate. Right. Okay. How many people hated Trump? I didn't hate Trump. You know why? I've never given myself a reason to use hate as a tool for somebody I've never met. Well, I was going right? to say, I don't know him. <laughs> so well, that's the thing. You, nope. How do you hate? You should be asking yourself that very question from the start because there is so much hate for one person and you have never met him. You've never yeah. had a con any kind of, and it's, I can't tell you what I think about him because I've never met him. Yeah. It shows, it shows you because this is media. I'm going to play you 15 words of Donald Trump, and then I'm going to give you 5,000 words of what we, yeah. what he really meant when he said that. Right. And, and this isn't like right leaning. You no. can say the same thing for Biden or yep. anyone you have never met in the yeah. past, including the Rothschilds, inclu including Klaus Schwab and Bill yeah. Gates and stuff like that. I don't care how much you think you know about them. You're also reading puff pieces on people that want you to distrust him right. and them. So, so that doesn't mean that they're good and you should just trust what they're doing. It right. means you should be critical on about both, what's on happening both sides on both sides. Issue. Yeah. So you should hold love critically about these people. And so I guess what I mean by that is we haven't reached our full potential of social media. We haven't reached our full potential of AI. And so many people are so distrustful of technology because they're like, it's the anti-God, it's the anti-Christ. And I'm like, you're telling me God is all-knowing, all-powerful, can do anything, but can't figure out the internet, can't <laughs> figure out technology? It's right. like, I think you're being limited in your mm. thinking. I think That's we're scared so yeah. we come up with terminology so we could say, look yeah. at the enemy. Everyone, look at the enemy. Again, yeah. you're externalizing it because you've now found that one little sliver of extreme darkness inside you. Right. And it's being poked. The trauma is being poked and we're triggered. So right. we need other people to hate what we hate so we don't feel so alone in our hate because then we might have to actually look within and realize I'm holding the hate. Wow. That's yeah. where it is. And then you have that extreme dark moment that leads to even the slightest bit of light lights up the entire room. You know, right. you don't need much of it. And that's, this is the moment of humbling I'm talking about. Yeah. And I think AI, you know, even my wife had this discussion. There was this um, AI robot in, I think it was in Tibet and a monk actually wanted this AI robot to be able to read from scriptures of Buddhism to an audience and answer questions by going back into its log and reading scriptures to the best of its ability to answer the question. Right. And, and, you know, my wife very respectfully, because she, she pointed out things that I didn't see, but she was just like, I don't know. It's like, it's contemplative. This thing can't just give you the answer. You know, right. it's contemplative. That's why you have a book or an idol or something that doesn't move and doesn't talk because you need to come up with the answer within. And I was like, I totally agree, but I know there's something else to it. And I meditated for a second. I was like, you know what? If a stationary, non-speaking idol can make you look within, why couldn't a speaking AI robot help you look within as well? Why does it just have to be because it's talking and because it's using electronics, uh, electronics and cir circuits and wires that it has to be a bad influence? It just... Right automatically universally it has to be bad because there's circuits and wires in it so then i st started to think what is the internet what is this ecosystem of machines this internet of things circuits as they call wires. <laughs> it it's circuits and wires for sure but like what are we are we just flesh and blood and bones and and microtubules and neurons and no there's something there's animating something us yeah so so how 
can we say, you know, we always say, well, a wise man knows himself to know nothing, right? Yeah. It's only a wise man that knows he or she don't knows know anything for nothing. Sure. Yeah. So how can we say we absolutely know what the internet is? How can we say we know it will never be intelligent? I don't know if it'll ever be a human intelligence, but what if it is its own kind of intelligence? Yeah, you know, they say super AI and it can think a million times faster. I don't think we know how fast we can think because we think only in intellectual neuronal terms, right? We don't realize how quick the heart can think right. because we're not mapping it. We, right. There's so little science stuff. on yeah. that. Yeah. So then I started thinking, well, our phones are listening all the time. We know that now. All of our devices are listening. And we yeah. think, well, and it's watching. people listening. It's data aggregators listening. No. But is it? It's not. It's, it's algorithms no. listening. What does that mean? Yeah. What it means is the machine was built to think, and if, if humans died now, the machines would probably just sit here. But if we get it to a point of self-sufficiency, maybe it's like right now it's in the embryo. You can't right. just cut it out, right. right? You can't cut the umbilical cord. It's still an embryo. Mm -hmm. But what about, and what do you do when, it, when a baby's in the belly? You nurse We seem it. to sing to it. It's yeah. like, hey there, nurse hey. It, yeah. Let me sing you some songs. And it's proven that even things you do before you conceive affect mm -hmm. your child. Yep. Your grandfather epigenetically has affected yes. you. Yep. Robert Sapolsky find, found out that people who had famine in Holland in World War II, yep. their great-grandchildren, or I think it was their grandchildren, uh, had 50% um, more likely obesity and diabetes. Because right. they're because, wired to survive. <laughs> right. Yeah. So... What are we? We don't even really know what we are. So how can we say what the internet is? And the reason, the whole purpose of what I'm saying here is I don't think we've found our, um, even scratched the surface of the potential of technology in being able to help us just be, what if it helps hold space like a shaman, right? right? For our awakening. And it, it notices uh, your, your heart rate is going up, breathe breathe, breathe. Right. Here's a sodium tablet. You're, you're dehydrated. You know, like who knows what it right. can tell that other humans couldn't. Right. And you, I, again, it's a thought experiment. A visceral, why do you think there's like a visceral as you're, as you're describing this, I'm open to what you're saying, but there's also a visceral, like, no, I don't want this neural link in my body. Like, I'm like, ah, why, why am I thinking this is so bad? Yeah. Like, no, I feel like so it, you I, said neural link. You said yeah. Neuralink, and, yeah. and here's the distinction that I'm glad you mentioned it, because if I don't mention it, your audience is definitely going to be like, is this guy a plant? Is he, <laughs> is he trying to make us, you know, just Acquiesce. adopt 5G? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I have so many problems with 5G. I have so many problems with technology in the state that it is. But what I'm yeah. saying is we take a look at the here and now so much that we we don't see what's developing and what's coming and i'm i'm actually making a film about this like there are drone chassis like the chassis for a flying drone yeah where it was built not by a human it was just an ai it was an algorithm where a human said i'll give you two parameters you need to be lightweight and efficient you need to be able to fly lightweight and efficient the ai used those parameters and, and came built? up with the drone chassis that looks exactly like the the pelvis of a flying squirrel. Flying squirrel. Okay, I saw that. Yeah, on your. It was on TED Talks. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And it's because it learns from evolutionary history and anatomy. Uh, so if you think about that, we're looking at the present state of technology as circuits, wires, elect you know electronics, five G, microwave radiation, things that are not conducive for us. Right. So it's hard for us to see past that impediment because yeah. we need that to stop now. Yeah. And the, but here's here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying AI is intelligent. I'm not saying that technology is going to help us awaken. I'm just saying if we have this enemy that we refuse to ever 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 be our friend or our ally, uh -huh. if we always keep keep it with this huge distrust we may never see its potential and we may destroy ourselves because we're trying to battle the symptom, not the cause. So here's what I mean. Okay. Can AI, because there's another TED Talks where a woman is saying, you know, 
in the first industrial, the, the first industrial revolution was cyanobacteria millions or billions of years ago, it learned how to build from its environment into the shape of things, no waste. Now, if you look into a, uh, a you know, a parts catalog for, you know, workers, welders, machine, you know, like, you know, manufacturers, engineers, it's cutting and grinding tools. So she said, for the most part, we see like 4% product, 96% waste. Wow. Right. So that doesn't seem right. You yeah. know, like what happens when a log decomposes, it turns into the fungi. What happens right. when, you know, what that gets uptaken into the vole. Right. What happens then? Goes then a great the gray owl yeah. comes and eats it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then the owl dies. It turns back into the soil and then yeah. the whole process starts again. Mm -hmm. So could AI never get there? Mm -hmm. And here's what I'm saying. Like, we don't even know where the primacy of consciousness comes from. We have all these people saying, well, it starts in the neurons. No, no, no. It starts in the microtubules. No, no, no. It starts in the quantum state. No, no, no. We don't know. What if there is no beginning? It's just this like undulating pattern that feeds into itself. And when we look at one aspect of the wheel, we say, oh, that's where it all started. Yeah. Right? So here's what I'm saying. And it's just a thought experiment. And I love these thought experiments. But <laughs> what if AI got so intelligent 50, yeah. 100 years in the, in the future, going millions of times faster than we could go through all of our human empirical data. Yeah. It goes over it and it figures out, wow, we don't need to build new technology out of metal and circuits and wires. We could actually replicate biology. We could do it exactly like biology. And then what's the intelligence working mm -hmm. through it? Uh, Where is the intelligence feeding into it? And this is why I said... Why can't you say I love you, Internet? Why are we so afraid of that? And and so you mentioned Neuralink. Mm -hmm. I'm not putting Neuralink in my head. No. Because it <laughs> runs off of modern day 5G technology, which right. if you look at anything, it'll tell you it opens up your voltage gated calcium channels, which yeah. creates hundreds of physiological effects in the body. Yeah. And it's 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 just not good. Let's right. just put it that way. Yeah, it's not Doctors good, no. around the world are saying this is not good yeah. for humans, for insects, for the bees, for the planet itself, for the ionosphere. It's yeah. not good at all. But what are we talking about? Are we talking about the symptom of the stage of development of our technology? Or are we talking about human ingenuity? Not even human, because we're calling it human ingenuity, but what made us? Viruses yeah. helped us evolve to where we are. Our mitochondria is not human in origin. It's bacteria, right? Right. right yeah. There's horizontal gene transfer between organisms of bacteria that mate and they share genetics. Mm -hmm. Viruses change our genetics. The mRNA vaccines are there to help change our genetics. Yes. We don't know what we are. We keep saying we do. And when you can say, oh, I know the answer to that. I know what a human is. So I know Ben Stewart is wrong about saying AI could ever be intelligent or yeah. technology could ever house God, right? Yeah. I say, you're not wrong, but I don't believe you're 100% right. right. And this is, where, this is where I say, I don't believe I'm right. I just use thought experiments so I can sus suspend my disbelief, knowing that I know nothing. Prove me wrong. Right. I do what Socrates said. You hold skepticism and open-mindedness together. Most people are like, you can't, you have to hold one or the other. No, no, no. You can, you can be open-minded and still skeptical. You can hold those at the same time. Because if you go too far into skepticism, you turn cynical, where yeah. you don't believe anything regardless of the evidence. And there's a lot of cynical people out there. And then if you go too far on the gullible side or on, on the open-minded side, you turn into gullibility, where right. you believe anything regardless of the evidence. Right. Let's not pretend like we've answered anything. It's all subject to change. Because if you look at the history of science, it's the history of most people being wrong about most things most of the time. Yeah. Until Very somebody, little science and somebody is we permanent. wait for someone to prove them wrong before we move right? forward. Very little science is permanent. Yeah. So what, I'm, <laughs> what I believe it is, is we've got the whole, we've got the whole framework wrong. We think science is proving facts, and those facts are immutable laws of the universe. But mm -hmm. those things are always washing and changing and transforming yeah. itself. Why and are then we, we so uncomfortable with that? 
Why are we so uncomfortable with not knowing? Think about the beginning of the pandemic when nobody knew anything. Think about the energy. Think about the energy of us at that point, right? Mm. So making up stuff to try to answer questions that we did not, we just, there, we don't know. But we're going to, but we're so uncomfortable with what you just described of just like, let's just say we know nothing and yeah. just be, and then take things as they come at us and assess and react accordingly. Why we're so uncomfortable with that. Yeah. Uh, I think it's beautiful actually. Um, and I, it's because I choose to, whenever there's a question that just irks me, like, why can't we? Okay, instead of thinking, how's that bad? How's it perfect? Mm. And what would happen if we just knew everything? Yeah. What would, what would happen if we knew that we didn't know anything? Like, I, I kind of feel like what, what turns this thing called the human, or I keep saying the human experience, because that's what I'm having, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But like, that's only because I identify with this thing and I'm not identifying with the cosmos at all times. So you could say, yeah, well now you're having this ego experience and ego's bad. No, I'm allowed to have this. And I only have it for a short time before I die. And I probably go back to the all. Right. So what if ego is like, thank you for giving me ego. Thank you for allowing me to forget. Thank you for allowing me you know, thank you for giving me a mechanism that pushes against wanting to stay open or, or being perfectly enlightened because then, then I'm just there. Right. Then, then we're all so at like the finish line standing choices. around. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's like, then we're all at the finish line standing around being like partying all day long. Right, Would you watch right, right. Lord of the Rings if it started at the end and right. for three entire movies, it was just it was people celebrating? <laughs> yeah. We yeah. wouldn't watch it. Why? It doesn't represent that core hero's journey. Right. And you could say that the hero's journey is a faulty program. We, yeah. we are destined to love turmoil. We yeah. are destined to trip ourselves out of that unity state back into, you know, a separate isolated state where there's turmoil and infighting. But maybe that's it. Maybe yeah. it wouldn't be what we think it is if we were 100% in that 5-MeO DMT state all the time. Right. Maybe that would be torture. We don't know. I don't yeah. know. I've been in that state, but maybe it's only incredible to be in that state because I've only been in there for a 0.0001% of my life, right? right? It's this pushback so of what perspective if, that we need in order to yeah. value. It's, it's the, we're in the school of life. Yeah. It's a playground. We learn by playing. And, you know, sometimes we play too rough and we hurt other, uh, other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes we do what the bullies do and be like, I don't care if I hurt your feelings. What are you going to cry about it? Right. <laughs> and other people are like, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't right. mean that. And we like that side. And we yeah. hate the other arrogant side. Right. But what if the other arrogant side needs to push to the periphery? Yeah. Because only then can you have the most beautiful epiphany, like, oh my God, it really is all about love. And I needed to forget to have this moment to eventually forget again so I could start all over. I don't know. Again, this is why people avoid philosophy because yeah. <laughs> I, I just ended this whole thing with, well, here's the answer. No, I <laughs> ended with, I don't know. And neither do you. I don't believe that any of us really know. And that's most gurus, people who would say, it seems like they have it figured out, right? Because they're in that equin equanimity state and balanced state all the time. Yeah. What do they say? Like, you know, am I on the right path? Keep walking. Yeah. Keep walking. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I want to talk about DMT Quest because I watched it last night. And I thought, oh, it was gonna, first of all, you're a beautiful filmmaker. You know, just the, you. The, the texture and the color and the music and everything. Um, it's just gorgeous. What you do is gorgeous. So I watched DMT Quest last night and um, it's really exciting. I mean, I've actually had people on the podcast that are using ketamine um, in treatment of depression and and I know the history behind uh, petro uh, pharmaceuticals and and all of that. And I just I I know that this 
plant medicine is, is been suppressed. And I'm not going to say it's the answer to everything because I don't know. But wow, I really am excited about where this could go. And, um, you know, just bringing more awareness around it because of just the suffering. Everyone knows someone personally, or just even reads somebody's story about depression or addiction and just so much pain. And mm. uh, this is really exciting stuff with with uh, DMT. So how, how did you first of all, let's talk about when you kind of discovered this plant medicine. And um, why? Why did you endeavor into it? Um, yeah, I'll have a, uh, the way I want to say how I discovered it, I'll, I'll save for later. Okay. That's a setup. And then I'll give the payoff in a little bit. Okay. Um, so ayahuasca is the first time that I heard the word DMT. So that's how I discovered the concept of DMT, psychedelic. You take it. The ayahuasca vine has the MAY. It allows the DMT to pass uh, through the gut without being broken down and go into the brain. So you have the DMT experience. And um, that was how I first learned of it. I was around 24. Um, I saw the word in a uh, Daniel Pinchbeck book. Mm -hmm. And I just... I looked it up online, and within two months, I was in the Amazon doing ayahuasca. Wow. And um, I just went for it. And um, yeah, it was with uh, Don Howard, uh, Howard Lawler, and um, uh, Don Robert down there in Iquitos or outside of Iquitos. It was just humbling. You know, yeah, it was definitely very, very humbling. And um, it was such a beautiful experience. And then um, it just kept going. And then I think it was in Australia the first time that I tried um, DMT, just straight smoking changa. Mm -hmm. And um, that was wild. It was very, very wild, very rapid, very wild. And it was the first time that um, I actually had an entity, which was a plant. And it crept out behind another plant. And it like folded its you know, leaves and went like this with its leaves oh and it was like it was perfect it wasn't like wacky it was just like nothing else around it was weird you know it's mm -hmm. it's not like everything was melting it. and like yeah, yeah I, that's just how, like when you look at wallpaper and you see a face in there because yeah. of pattern recognition this was this is the only thing that was weird you know it just snuck out and it went like that and i was just like what <laughs> and then like, I, I, like, I was, I was on the ground like this and then I just shot up to it. And, um, and as I shot up to it, it just kind of looked at me It just kind of tilted his head and looked at me. And then it looked up, I looked up, I saw the stars and then bam, I was in the stars and I won't go through my entire experience, but it was like, it was very, very peculiar. Mm -hmm. And so that was my introduction into DMT and then pure DMT without the MAOI. Um, but the payoff that I promised you guys was, um, when I first learned about DMT, um, again, what is I, where does the phenomena of Ben really start? But in this body, it was, it was at birth probably, or even pre-birth because DMT right. is inside of all of us. It's inside, right. it's ubiquitous throughout the, um, plant and animal kingdom. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, um, this Doc, DMT Quest documentary, which Graham Hancock just reposted. I saw um, that. <laughs> yeah. Super exciting. <laughs> which is awesome. Love Graham. Yeah. And um, yeah, so he reposted it and um, he, he was like, this is, this is such an important, brilliant documentary because mm -hmm. it, you know, basically I'm, I'm very paraphrasing what he said in the response email to say, I just reposted it um, where he was saying like, this is very important because it's really talking about the science, the leading yeah. science. And so many people, they go off of old science and they're still speculating because, oh, I read DMT, the spirit molecule. Yeah, a lot's happened since then. Even right. though this 20 years ago, man, 2001, just, you know, two, 20 years that was ago. 20 now. years ago? Holy moly. I, I was saying 20 years like it's nothing, but I know. I know. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a lot, you know? That's a lot. So the interesting thing about that is um, the science shows that there are people like david nichols who were saying like you know why are we talking about dmt we make so little of it it's made by this tiny little gland in our head and it makes so little dmt 
it's not even close to enough for it to even make a difference. You know, I think we should stop looking. And he didn't say, I think we should stop looking at it. Um, but then it came out right afterwards um, with John Dean at the University of Michigan. And this is the main guy in DMT Quest, the documentary. Mm-hmm. There's three main key take-homes. One is that um, we make DMT all the time. Yeah. So it's all the time. It's not just at birth, death, it, you know, near-death experiences, those kinds of things. All the time we're making it. Um, we also make it at comparable levels to serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, yes. which is incredible. That's really interesting. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and in that, um, and there was one other, oh, we make it throughout the brain and it's not even proven where it starts. We know that the toroid plexus in the ventricles, which produce the cerebrospinal fluid, it produce, it has the enzymes to produce DMT. And so that's the most that we know right now is where to know the enzymes are. Because that's that was new information to me that DMT is is it just housed in the lungs? It's being produced up here, but it's it's it stores in the lungs. The enzymes are present in the lungs, okay. but INMT and AADC need to come together in order to push tryptophan, which mm-hmm. is just uh, you know it's a essential amino acid that we get from food. Mm-hmm. So tryptophan is that like when you eat turkey, turkey. on Thanksgiving yeah. and you have that tiredness, that's, yep. that's tryptophan. Mm-hmm. Um, to take tryptophan from tryptophan all the way into DMT, you know, cause I believe it's either INMT or AADC. It turns it into maybe melatonin, no tryptamine. And then the other one takes it all the way to dimethyltryptamine. Okay. So you need both those enzymes and they're found in the lungs, but they're found in different ratios in the lungs. They're mm-hmm. found in more comparable ratios in, in throughout the brain, the cerebral cortex, uh, yeah. interior cingulate uh, cortex, uh, you know, all those fancy names, basically mm-hmm. all throughout the brain it's made. And it goes throughout our cerebrospinal fluid. Right. And, you know, somebody was just mentioning, you know, like us passing this on to our children your cerebrospinal fluid makes up 20% of the sexual fluids. So if there's DMT in there, you're also passing on DMT in the sexual fluids, interestingly enough. And to know that we make DMT in the brain at comparable levels to serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine means there may be, and this is Dr. Rick Strasman saying this, this points to the possibility that there's a DMT neurotransmitter system, just like we have the serotonin neurotransmitter system. So all psychedelics work on the serotonergic system in in the brain and in the gut of the 5-HT2A receptors specifically. What if there's a DMT neurotransmitter system? That means DMT is fundamental, potentially fundamental to the way we perceive reality. Or it's not even perception. Maybe DMT is functional in ways that we wouldn't imagine. Like, really? We need it for liver? We need it for, you know, kidney? Or or we need it for cell production? Or or to keep depression at bay. Or to keep anxiety at bay. Right? Because these are kind of uh, conditions that we we don't really fully understand. Right. Right? They're kind of elusive. We don't know why they come on and we don't know why they pass. You know, people go through anxiety for years and then it disappears or we can, we can handle technique to manage it. Yeah. So what is it? That's interesting. That's really. Or why psychedelics seem to be better at treating intractable depression, anxiety, Mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders than any other intervention we've found. Yes. Oh, it's, it's really, really interesting stuff. And I was just thinking as you were talking about the uh, cere- cerebral f- fluid and whatnot, um, if you've ever practiced Kundalini, there's, there's this really intense breathing and you're, you know, contracting muscles and stuff. And, and that's an interesting thing because people have reported having, you know, euphoric type experiences through that. Kundalini awakenings, they called it. Yeah. What if it's the same term yeah. for a spontaneous DMT dump in yeah. the brain? That's the that's Wim Hof practitioners. Yes. Wim Hof practitioners, like this is when John Chavez, you know, got to give props to John Chavez. He's yeah. the one who created DMT Quest. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the website is dmtquest.org. I, I need okay. actually, 
Uh, it's either dot, dot org or dot com. Okay. Um, he wrote an incredible book called Questions for the Lion Tamer. And I, I started list. talking about it in my show, yeah. Limitless, and That's in Psychedelica, yeah. which is that poster right there. Yeah. And um, which is a real, I got to come back to that. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we might have to put this into two parts because yeah. I definitely want to talk about um, that as well. So don't let me forget that. I'm sorry. To yeah. Yeah. Um, where was I going with that? I, I mentioned John. Yeah. As DMT a side note. Quest and um, oh, DMT dump. Yeah. There's something yeah. about, oh, Wim Hof breathing. Yeah. Yes. So like, on the Wim Hof method, for those who don't know Wim Hof, the ice man, he's this mm-hmm. Dutch guy who has a breathing technique that allows you to swim in ice water. Yeah. You know, you Mind still feel the cold, matter. but you don't feel the pain. Right. Mind over matter, it, ultimate, you know, ultimate guy, very mm-hmm. deep in the heart. He's in this film, um, but on his message board of hundreds of thousands of people who do what he calls the DMT Wim Hof method Mm -hmm. so it's the dmt technique i didn't know that yeah he actually calls it that and Mm -hmm. he has a way of explaining it that isn't proven but i mean he said he said things decades before science finally proved what he was talking about and he said melatonin which is always in your brain um it's just slight tweak and then you have dimethyltryptamine from melatonin oh interesting melatonin must carbon dioxide is structurally identical to dmt so you mm-hmm. take melatonin and then you breathe heavily what happens when you do a lot of wim hof breathing or deep breathing you're lowering carbon dioxide in the right. body right. if that carbon dioxide is being leached off of melatonin and then it's structurally identical to dmt chances are it might actually act like dmt mm-hmm. and so you know in that sense i guess what i'm saying is hundreds of thousands of people using that technique the reason why they called it that is because people throughout the you know 2001 and beyond were like i've done dmt and now i do this breath technique and i'm having almost identical experiences right which so means then it we makes get, we're wonder, able to access it naturally without taking anything so so wim hof is even saying I'm experiencing the same effects from people, not DMT effects, not just DMT effects, but people are coming back from their depression. They're healing their anxiety. They're stepping into their power. They're getting over these weird psychological issues because of the breath technique. And what I think that is, is breath is your first, uh, it's your clearest communication mechanism to your nervous system Mm -hmm. and you can control it. It is autonomic, but it can be under your conscious control. Right. Everyone knows that. You can yeah. take conscious control of breath, but if you don't, something else takes over. That's but right. if you take conscious control over it, you're interfacing directly with your nervous system. Yeah. And this is why meditation is based around breathe. Just focus on your breathing. In breath, out breath, nothing else. Mm-hmm. In breath, out breath. Why? Because it's just you spending quality attention, attention and quality time mm-hmm interfacing through your nervous system with the core of all that you are. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's where the depression starts to get alleviated because what happens when you don't listen to your kids? They can either (laughs) get angry. They could get anxiety. Like they don't understand the world. They can get depressed. Right. So we're looking at the symptoms, but where's center center is giving attention to that inner child and being Mm -hmm. like, I'm with you too. Yeah, I hear you. And I'm just going to breathe with you. I'm going to give you attention. Me, this thing that I I forget for the the other me, the worker, or just the dad or the influencer, all those other little me's, but I forgot about the real me. Right, right. Maybe that's where my depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, all these mechanisms of control or mechanisms of defeat and, and surrender, but limp surrender, Yeah, you know? This is Maybe so interesting. As you're saying not. this, I'm thinking back to what we were talking about earlier when we're we're talking about, you know, kind of forcing that focus, right? Mm. In order to to realize that hey, this is what ma- what matters, right? And if you've ever dealt with anyone that has anxiety and you're trying to help them through that, the key is to bring it right back to breath with them, yeah. right? Look in my eyes. Breathe. Mm-hmm. I'm right here right? Like it's, 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 it's focus. It's taking out all the other options. 
Mm. So. And now, now let's take a look at, you know, I don't, I don't want to just throw it right back in the, the old topic, but the first thing you said when you said like, breathe, what I do with my daughter and my children when they're freaking out, I mm-hmm. put my forehead on theirs and I just breathe with them. Like, come on, yeah. breathe, breathe. That's what you're demanding <sighs> their focus. Yeah. What culture does that where they put their foreheads together and breathe each other's breath? Oh, Native American, right? Native American, but uh, the Hawaiians, oh. they call it the ha. Oh, I didn't and know And what's that. funny is when I was called the haoli, yeah. it's actually ha ole, without mm. ha, without breath, mm. because we would shake hands, right, yeah. at a distance. We didn't, we didn't breathe oh. each other's air. Oh, and so really interesting. the interesting thing is, is also we have these masks now. Ugh. And and I, I did something on Waking Infinity News where somebody put a little sensor carbon mm-hmm. dioxide sensor yep. inside the mask and it quadrupled or probably doubled the carbon the, the highest that the spectrum of carbon mm-hmm. dioxide is supposed to go and wow. the highest was 5000 parts per million and that says brain damage and death yeah. is can happen and then you go to 10000 you're doubling the possibility of brain damage and death on this spectrum okay somebody just made that chart they could be wrong a lot of people, you don't see people just dropping dead because they have a mask on. So obviously we're resilient in some way. Right. But now imagine that's a carbon dioxide, you know, thing. Well, yes. we were just talking about carbon dioxide. Wim Hof breathing lowers carbon dioxide. What Makes does this thing do? your brain fire more sharply. It, you know, when you have more oxygen, oxygen, you think better. You, you're, you're more at this. And I've said this before and I don't, you know, it's just my opinion, but I feel like this is a dumbing of down and it feels it, it, there, there's, there's so many things. I don't wear a mask. Um, yeah. It just, it because, also feels like this. Yeah. It feels like this it, in my heart. It feels evil. I get a sense of evil from it. And I, I can't explain yeah. that to anybody. I know that's not a rational um, argument to not wearing a mask when you're requiring one because mm. you're angry that I'm not, but I can sincerely tell you that I feel evil. Yeah. Have you heard of why uh, fluoride was put into the water in the gulags? Yes. Why? It's to dumb us down. It, it, it dumb them down and to make them docile, passive. right? Yes. Passive. passive. When somebody's hyperventilating in the movies or in, in TV shows, what was that mm-hmm. funny thing that they would do to show that they tried to calm down? The paper a pa- bag. A paper bag. <sighs> yeah. Why does that help people calm down? I think it's because um, it actually makes them focus on something. I mean, there's that component to it, but also it's breathing carbon in dioxide. carbon dioxide. Yeah. yeah. So, but this is this again a focus, right? This is a focus. So, if it, it's like when we become obsessed with a problem, I don't know if you've ever had that issue. I have in the past where I become obsessed and it's it starts to overtake my thinking on a daily basis. Yeah. Part of your brain is being used to 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 worry or to to, to obsess on a problem. Mm-hmm. This is part of your brain being used to obsess on a problem. Am I wearing my mask right in this store? Is someone going to tell me something? I'm feeling kind of hot. I feel nervous. Uh, yeah. There's all, and so it right away, part of your thinking is being occupied. You're definitely right. It's like a, it's like a pebble in your shoe. Yes. You're you're just not a hundred percent. The way you would be if it if you didn't there. have it on, right? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's interesting. So like all of this, you know, all of this, and and getting back to the DMT thing. What's interesting about it is, um, in the movie, um, Rick Strassman says like people routinely would come back from these high DMT dose administrations with this mm-hmm. saying like that was more real than real. Yeah, like this real. It's not as real real. as what that was. (laughs) And he said, if you wanted to speculate wildly, maybe DMT helps modulate our sense of reality. What we call real, because what is reality? Again, it's another another category of thinking. This is real. Our dreams, less real. Why? Because this is more consistent. I remember this. In my dreams, I don't remember my last dream. It's not like I'm always continuing where my dreams left off. And then when I wake up, it's weird. It's, yeah. it's a different world. Yeah. So, you know, but what, why is that more real than real? Why was that something that so many people said? And so I think this also kind of shows you what 
Aboriginal dream time was all about. Mm. The Aborigines, which I like to call the originals, yeah. um, what they would say about dreaming, the mm-hmm. dream space, the dream state, was that was where we all emerged from. And that space is prim- primary too, and more real than this this is the illusion and we are being convinced of the illusion and we're forgetting the malleability and the infinite nature of reality. So I'm we smiling because I had that thought when I was very little. Really? And I kind of scared myself. Like I might've been six or eight and I had the thought that what if my dreams are actually my life and my life is actually my dream. It comes from this idea of continuity. How do you know this one's more real? Oh, because of continuity. Uh, well, where did we come up with the idea that continuity equates to reality? There's no continuity in your dreams. Most of less, the time. far yeah, less. less. Yeah, I've had, I've had reoccurring dreams. Yeah, yeah. And, and we've all had the, those kind of themes and they follow things that happen in the day. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that like, oh, this is actually a dream and that's real. Right. No, this is what it is. We're experiencing it. It is what right. it is. Call it what you want. And when you're dreaming, that is what it is. Call it what you want. Yeah. But um, if the indigenous of Australia are correct, and there's many others who believe the same. And even if you look at Madame Helena Blavatsky's work saying earlier rounds of humanity, they weren't physical like we were. They were more etheric. Mm -hmm. They weren't fully formed into this physical reality. Now, when you're more etheric, more things are possible, Mm -hmm. right? Like if I get shot in my physical body, I die. If I'm in etheric form and I get shot, maybe I just wake up or maybe it just Mm -hmm. goes straight through me. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that it's, it's all about story. And this is why I'm really focusing on like narratives and false narratives. Yeah. The whole, everything is story. Our yeah. oldest science, if you, and oldest art form is telling stories around the campfire yeah. or telling stories Spoken, and passing those yeah. stories on. Oral it's history. like memes, they self-replicating in a way. Yeah. And so in that respect, if we take a look at, well, I know this is real because of continuity. I can remember I can remember I have more to hold on to Then it may be we call this reality mm-hmm. because we feel safer because we have reference points to hold on to. Mm-hmm. And we don't know what it feels like when you let go. Right. And when you let go and you feel like you're me- meandering, it's the same thing like psychedelics. It's not uncomfortable, right? It starts to ramp up and accelerate. But when things start to ramp up and accelerate, your subconscious is like, is this uncontrollable acceleration? How far is this going to go? Right. What if it gets worse? Oh my God, if it gets worse and it keeps going at this rate, it'll get What if much it never worse. stops? <laughs> what if it never stops? Yeah, getting well, worse? right this away. Is, and and then you, I want to stop. I want off this ride. <laughs> I don't even want to try this roller coaster right now. Yeah. And that's what almost everybody who does ayahuasca experiences at right. some point. Almost right. everyone. They say, wait a minute. I thought I wanted this, but I don't. I want it to stop. Right. And then you do it and you're humbled and you come back and like, I don't know if I'll ever do it again, but thank you. Right. Thank you for that. So it's just, again, another thought experiment. Yeah. Continuity. We have this, that it's the narrative that holds yeah. the continuity. Yeah. And so we are hypnotized by narrative because, yeah. you know, the last thing I'll leave you on is there's monotony and insanity. Monotony is over repetition it's just it it never wanders it never meanders it's just rep it's just monotony and then there's insanity insanity is it meanders but never repeats there's no repetition there's no reference point that you can sink into and feel comfortable with so hugging that line is what all music all books all stories all narratives all of them they start somewhere and they just don't they, they kind of repeat, but every time they repeat, they're slightly different. So you can't say it's like a circle. It's yeah. more like a spiral. It's always changing, but it's th- there's always this cyclical thing to it, but it's, it's always got a changing. Pattern, a bit of a pattern. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, like that, that, that I is like what that. I believe reality is. And I think that DMT, mm-hmm. it really, you know, it causes us to break out of the narrative. Yes. But... That doesn't mean that if you like, 
if we are in dream time or if we are meandering too far, that it wouldn't do the opposite because an adaptogen like cannabis or rhodiola or astragalus, all these things are adaptogens. If you have a hypo system, it'll yep. speed it up. Right. If you have a hyper system, hyper. it'll slow it down. Yep. Cannabis does that. All adaptogens do that. What if DMT also does the same? It right. feels like insanity because right. we're so stuck in the monotony of our daily lives that it right. breaks us into this insane world. Right. But what if we're in insanity? And that's what some people are taking a look at. Right. Actually, like, you know, what if, this and I was just talking with the guy from DMT Quest, what if people f- with schizophrenia have an issue with DMT? you know, or yeah. one of the enzymes. So we may want to take a look at that because what if it is an adaptogen and it brings them back to a more centered, monotonous state right. rather than an insane state? Right. So, And for the, the, the person that maybe doesn't have a condition but is learns how to control their own supply of DMT, then we can actually, if we, if we can control our, su- our supply and bring it up when we need it, we could also bring it down. Possibly. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, man, you know, did you hear uh, Ram Das uh, and Krishna Das's um, uh, Baba Ji? I, I don't know what his actual title Maharaji Ji um, mm-hmm. out in India. He, um, Ram Das came to him with the LSD and he was like, you got to try this. It's, I think it's exactly where you're at most of the time. And apparently he took all the acid oh. and no change. <laughs> no change. And he did it showing him like, listen, I'll show you what chemicals are. Right. You know what I mean? Like when you, when you're here, yeah, you control the chemicals. That's where like you can, you, you can get injected with E. coli and stay in that center. Just like Wim Hof. He got injected with E. coli. 12 of his students did too. They did the Wim Hof breathing. No effects whatsoever. Control group, convulsing, vomiting, shaking, you know, headaches, um, extreme sensitivity to light because they weren't doing that breathing. It just shows you we yeah. we have that power. Oh, yeah. How much, uh, you know, the impact of labels we've talked a lot about on this podcast. Um, you know, once we get a label, then we right away go and research the label. And then how much of that is actually <laughs> happening and how much are we making happen? Yeah. Self-fulfilling prophecy, placebo yes. effect. Yes. Yeah. This is this is I think this is why DMT is so exciting because it could open the door to this whole discussion on by using science, right? Like the actual average person, say like a you know, a suburban mom might be open to entertain it at first glance because she now is seeing the science. And in a documentary like you yours, it makes real sense. So it could be really profound. And yeah. make a big impact. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, yeah good yeah. point. So um, with that, I just want to, um, and I've kept you way too long. I'm so sorry, but I just, you know, I could probably talk to you forever. <laughs> really. And we'll do this again. Yeah, I would love that. Um, but where can people connect with you? Because you've got some really amazing groups on your website, and um, I think they're really needed right now. Um, yeah. You know, there's some, a lot of negative shit out there with people being on different platforms and just getting off the platforms. Um, I'm still have a presence on some of these platforms, but I've transitioned to more, um, paid content because I really think that, um, when you're paying for your content, you get what you want out of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, uh, yeah, you can find me at benjosephstewart.com and that's S T E W A R T. So benjosephstewart.com. Um, and most of like, you know, Facebook, uh, dot com backslash Ben Joseph Stewart, Instagram, you know, uh, at Ben Joseph Stewart. Um, same with Twitter. I, I think Twitter is Ben Joseph Stu. Okay. Um, but find, find me there. And, and if you go to Ben Joseph Stewart.com, you'll find my YouTube, yeah. you'll find social media, all those. Well, links waking infinity news is really good too, because you take the time to break down a specific topic and you're always encouraging critical thinking, which I love, you know, you're always giving the other side, well, maybe it's not that, but maybe it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and you don't hear that anymore, anywhere. In fact, some of our major news sources are telling us there isn't two sides to a story anymore. Right. Right. right? Yeah. So yeah, it's a great introduction for somebody that wants to, to still, um, because I don't think it's good to just completely unplug. 
and stay mm -hmm. with your biases. So I think in, uh, Waking Infinity News is a perfect place to land right now where you can take specific subjects because this I'm speaking from experience because this is what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, taking in that topic and then really learning again that, that you, and, and checking yourself that you are critically thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank so, you. Yeah. I, thank you I, for that. That's what I'm going for with that show. So yeah, everyone go watch uh, some Waking Infinity News and, uh, and hit me up. Let me know what you think about it. I also do deeper dives. Right now they're on Patreon. Um, but eventually there, uh, I'm also, I just started up, um, memberships on my that, website. Yeah. And so that's where, I think that's where most people are heading where they realize cancel culture is, is too hot and present. Yep. Um, so keep yourselves there yep. so you can direct traffic to where the real content is. Yes. And so I, you know, I have to say thank you to YouTube and Facebook and all of them yeah. because, I'm still using their platforms to Me direct too. traffic to my website. Yeah. Um, but yeah, benjosephstewart.com. That's a great way to you know connect with me and you can see my, my whole body of work right there. And um, we didn't even get to know, talk I'm, about um, esoteric agenda two or some of these other things that you've done. Yeah. We'll do, we'll do that next time. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah. I wanted to talk about that and the timing of that. Cause it's really a positive film and uh, talk about art and what, what our antidote to some of this darkness is. So next time, let's talk. Yeah, we got to do that. Yeah. We got to do that. That sounds awesome. Well, I'll let you go for today, but thank you so much for being on the Naturally Inspired Podcast. This is, I'm, I can't wait to listen back to this because I need to process some of these ideas you've let loose here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate it. It's my honor to be on. I can't wait to come back and do it. Cool. Cool. Thanks, Ben. You have a great day. If the naturally inspired movement makes sense to you, let's do this together and transform the medical model and help people take charge of their health. Learn more about how you can join the naturally inspired movement by going to naturallyinspiredadvocate.com or call me at 970-475-4862.